Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to this session. In this presentation, I'm talking about communication after a disaster. Based on my own experience during Fukushima nuclear disaster and COVID-19 pandemic. My background is a medical doctor and public health researcher, and I lived in Fukushima after the nuclear power plant accident for about four years. And I have conducted communication with the residents about health risks after the accident. And also, I'm currently involved in activities to establish guidelines of COVID-19 for restaurants and nursing homes. So I have experiences in communication during the two disasters. And actually, the two disasters have much in common because nuclear disaster and pandemic are categorized into the same disaster called Seaburn disaster. Seaburn is a, an acronym of chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive. And in Seaburn disaster, invisible hazards like chemical substances or radiation may cause social havoc that leads to multiple health, health impact. But before talking about Seaburn disaster, what is common in disaster in general? Roughly speaking, disaster is a situation in which society is overwhelmed by an event. In all social capacity is enough to manage it. But in disaster setting, the size of the event is too large or social capacity get decreased like due to political instability, conflict, etc. And as a result, in disaster setting, social capacity cannot manage an event. This decrease in social capacity increases vulnerability to many risks because risk is explained by a formula that hazard multiplied by exposure multiplied by vulnerability. For example, after a nuclear disaster, not only health risks due to radiation exposure, but also obesity, mental stress, and job losses may increase. In the same way, after a pandemic disaster, not only risk of infection, but also risk of lack of exercise, mental stress, job losses may increase. So in disaster, there is a simultaneous increase in multiple risks. To manage such multiple risks, we need to establish defense in depth. But sometimes this defense in depth result in just many layers of defense. For example, Japanese government has established countermeasures against nuclear accident. And it was innovative that they included off-site countermeasures, countermeasures outside of the nuclear power plant. But this plan just focus on prevention of health impact by radioactive substances. So you can easily see this defense may not prevent health impact caused by mass evacuation, but rumor and job losses, which were actually observed in Fukushima. And in the same way, during COVID-19 pandemic, many scientific strategies are being established, like quarantine, or identification of patients using PCR testing or enhancing healthcare capacity. But these countermeasures may not prevent depression, lack of exercise due to staying at home, stigmatization against patients, and infodemic, which are prevalent in 
the world. So in such situation, just science and logic may not be sufficient. We need to establish measures to prevent stigma and discrimination, to prevent infodemics, or promote recognition of indirect health impact, such as depression. To do so, communication about not only science, but also our life is a key. But of course, it is easier said than done. And experts often say talking about science with lay people is difficult. Especially talking about some kind of science like vaccination, GM food, global warming, insecticides, or nuclear power plant are extremely difficult. But why it is difficult? Here are experts' common considerations. They may say they people do not understand science and logic, so we need to use plain words and visualizing techniques. Or others may say people are too emotional to accept scientific facts after a disaster, so we must show sympathy and politeness before talking about science. Or others even give up communication by saying people's views are biased by interests and ideology and it's no use talking with such people. These are true to some extent, but it is important to know that this viewpoint might be enlightenment of people and not communication. And how Enlightenment and communication are different. In enlightenment, experts teach people. So after enlightenment, experts and people become the same color. But in communication, both experts and people should learn. And so after the communication, both experts and patients' colors might be changed because communication is a process of learning from each other. But in disaster settings, why both should learn? Some experts have different opinion because experts usually think they are doing some science communication. So their job is to teach people about science. But Sometimes people may not consider radiation or infection as science. Or experts may think it is risk communication because they are talking about risks. It is true, but sometimes what experts are talking about and what lay people are talking about are different. Let me show you several examples. First example is discrepancy in facts. Experts often think sound facts would reduce anxiety among the residents. But through communication with the residents in Fukushima, I learned that there is a gap between scientists and residents about what is sound. Residents often say like, why are academic papers more reliable than our own experience. For example, I provided a lecture to the le residents about radiation and said incremental radiation dose in Fukushima is negligible. And it is less likely that people in Fukushima get more cancer due to radiation exposure. But after this lecture, the residents said, but my neighbors were diagnosed as cancer after the accident, and you are seeing cancer patients every day. So I don't understand why you say cancer is not increasing here. After repeating such conversation, I realized that there is a gap in what are sound facts. 
Scientists usually exclude all the year by talking about facts, like tails in distribution curve or outliers in scatter plots. And a case report is way less on than cohort studies. But people rely on personal experience as well, like my neighbors are diagnosed as cancer. And even more, mass media mainly reports outlier, like a girl in Fukushima was diagnosed as thyroid cancer. So to speak, dog bites a man is not news, and man bites a dog is news. But we should know that both are sound information. Another example is a gap in probability and facts. Experts often think showing sound statistics may reduce anxiety. But as risks are unknown by nature, talking about statistics may not reduce anxiety among the residents because residents often say, why do you talk about scientific forecasts in such a convincing manner? For example, I provided a lecture to the residents about thyroid cancer among the children in Fukushima and explained that from some statistics, this increase of thyroid cancer among children in Fukushima can be explained by screening effect to early de detection of cancer. But after this lecture, some residents said to me, but it is not proven in the real world. Or how can you explain the fact that more than 100 children are suffering now? And through this conversation, I understand that these are not misunderstanding, but it's just difference in value. And the scientists often treat statistics as a fact. For example, on March, a researcher published an article and estimated that the novel coronavirus will kill half a million people in the UK and two million in the US. And most of the scientists and policymakers treated this estimation as a fact and established countermeasures. I don't know whether it is due to this countermeasure, but actually this toll up to now is about a tenth of this estimation. But at that time, it was not wrong information. But we should know there is a gap between estimation and real. And actually, most of scientific evidence we are talking about in a disaster are probabilities. We talked about cancer risks in Fukushima or health effect of radiation exposure after the accident. And we are now talking about forecasting curve of infection, about COVID-19. But these statistics may not always ease public anxiety because people know that this is not a fact. They may think that the difference between 99.99% of probability and real is not just 0.01%, but there is an insuperable barrier between the present and the future. And another example is risk comparison. Experts often provide risk comparison because they think by comparing radiation or infection risk with risks in daily life, people will become able to make an appropriate choices. But through communication, I found that people may not always think the compared risks are safe. I was often said, experts are cheating us by comparing radiation risk or infection risk with only incredibly high risks like smoking. For example, we compared radiation levels in Fukushima and other radiation exposure levels nat from natural resources. 
Once I showed radioactive potassium contained in daily foods and showed this picture, radiation image of pork, banana, and ginger. And several days after this lecture, I was sad. After hearing your lecture, I became afraid of eating banana. And finally, there is a huge gap in risk trade-offs. Experts often think that concept of risk trade-offs may help us talking about risks. But actually, some people may feel as if they are blamed for choosing larger risks or wrong risks. I was said by a mother in Fukushima, I understand statistics and epidemiology, but still I cannot stop pursuing zero risk for my child. Another mother said to me, whenever experts said this risk is negligible, I felt as if they are scoffing at me, my fear of radiation or infection. In the real life, we cannot trade off all risks. When experts were asked, like, can I live in Fukushima? Experts may provide only measurable risks, like risk of radiation exposure at, on one side of balance and risk of lifestyle change or economic burden on the other. But in the real life, people should put much more on both sides of the balance. For example, when they stay in Fukushima, they may have a risk of stigmatization or a risk of being blamed for parental responsibility. Or when they evacuate it, they may have a risk of losing friends or risk of mental stress. And also they may suffer from peer pressure in their community, which changes day by day. And these risks are unmeasurable and they cannot trade off all the risks. This is partly because sense of value is different by individuals. When an expert provided a lecture about radiation exposure and cancer risks, an old woman raised her hand and asked the expert, then when can we restart picking wild vegetables? And the expert could not answer this question because they could not understand how much valuable picking wild vegetables for the residents. And risk choice is not a right and wrong matter because all safety or risk is a subjective matter. Definition of safety by ISO is freedom from unacceptable risk. And what is unacceptable varies by individuals. For example, I personally cannot accept these risks because I don't like high places or speed. But most of the people do not think of this as a risk. So how safe is safe depends on the person and the situation. And some people pursue fun at any cost. Many people like bungee jump or they many people eat sweets by knowing it is a health risk. Or some people love to go to crowded place even when they know there is a risk of infection. And even more, Japanese people usually eat fugu. But ovary of fugu contains one of the strongest poison in the world. And no one knows how valuable it is for you. So when we are talking about risks, we are talking about not science, but life. I asked the reasons why people think cancer is increasing in Fukushima in communication. And some people answered, because my neighbors got cancer. By saying so, the residents are ma making fact-based decision. And others answered, 
because it is safer to take an action based on an assumption that cancer is increasing and they are public health minded people or even when people think so just from sense of fear it is biologically natural response for self-defense so there are no scientific logics based on life so i call it life communication and life communication is a process to put all possible risks on the same table and not showing the right answers because the aim of life communication is not to achieve minimum risk but to enable people to choose risks based on their own sense of value And such communication should not be left to experts because experts are sometimes the most divided people. In Fukushima, many people say their congenital heart diseases and others argued back. Some say morphological defects in increase and others argued back. And some said thyroid cancer is increasing and others rebutted it and after such debate a resident said to me why can we believe scientists when their opinions are always most divided actually there is a scientific evidence that scientists might be the most divided people this is a really popular research and researchers asked people that do you agree or disagree with this opinion that there is solid evidence of recent global warming due to mostly to human activities such as burning fossil fuels and interestingly people with higher scientific intelligence are more likely to make decision based on their value those who supported liberal democrats are more likely to answer yes and those who supported conservative republican are more likely to answer no and again who should learn from communication after a disaster there are much assumption or bias experts have and experts have much to learn from the com communication so my opinion is that knife communication after a disaster may be a process through which experts can learn their own life and here are key takeaways during and after a huge disaster, social capacity is overwhelmed and many risks increase simultaneously. In such situation, technical knowledge and logical thinking may not be enough. Because what people need or want to know at that time is not a truth, but a balance. And talking about a balance of risks is almost equivalent to talking about our life as experts are not always an experts of life life communication after disaster is a precious opportunity for us experts to learn our own life thanks for listening